encryption does hope that you enjoyed this rare and infamous moment that combines a first-rate disaster with genuine historical significance. But now it's time to take a deep breath and get those cameras out as we prepare to temporally reset you to one of the most fantastic catastrophes in history. Are you ready? Everyone and welcome to a Time Shifters podcast. This is Christopher, and I'm here as always with Tom. Hi. How you been, Tom? It's just us today. It, it, it is. It's a little strange. Uh, uh, I mean, we've got just a standard show. We haven't done that in a while. Yeah, we've had some some special guests come on and join us and uh, and talk about their stuff. Talk about any stuff. We had a lot of fun with uh, Rick last episode with uh, Speed Racer. So much fun that I posted it a week early. You did. I'm not. Not sure how or why I did that. I didn't realize I did that until a day after I, <laughs> I put it up there. I, I, I was a little mystified myself when all of a sudden it popped up. And I'm like, wait, wait, what? <laughs> we just recorded yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. I, and then maybe that's what threw me off is I often don't get the editing done until the, like, the few days before it should post. Right. But I actually got ahead of the game and actually got it edited that week. And I think that just, it threw me off. I was like, oh, I got it done just in time. Post. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you were well ahead of schedule. No, but that also means that listeners got a chance to hear a couple of my five-minute reviews. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then I wanted to thank you and uh, any of our listeners uh, for the uh, well wishes on my birthday. That was much appreciated. Absolutely. Well, well-deserved, uh, you know. Again, happy birthday, and I hope you had a wonderful uh, day at that. I took a nice five-day break for, for, for that this time around. It was dumb luck that it ended up five days, but sure, I went with it. Nice. Well, no, that's a, that sounds like a really great break. I took a long weekend recently myself. It was just a just a three day weekend, mm-hmm. but it's an amazing what that extra day will do. Mm-hmm. You actually feel like you have stepped away from work. Just making the case more for the four-day work week. <laughs> yeah, it it feels so much. I I couldn't believe how more relaxed and everything I was by the end of Sunday and going into Monday. And I don't think I felt quite as much of that existential dread that I usually do around six or seven o'clock Sunday night <laughs> when you realize this is Sunday. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, there's something to be said because uh, honestly, I've run into those occasions where too much time off does start to feel weird too so Mm, yeah so yeah when you can get at least a three-day weekend uh, going into work is not so hard yeah other than the fact that you you end up the the five-day week feels really long (laughs) well yeah that which is why we need to find a way to perpetuate that (laughs) yes Yes, here we're, we're we're recording on a Wednesday, and this is the the week after my my three day weekend, and already I feel like the week's over, right? <laughs> uh, unfortunately, this week uh, myself is only a four day week, and then I'm going into a vacation, which is nice. But uh, uh, even with it being a four day week, it's just so freaking full of things. That mm. that of like it might as well be six or seven days. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna earn that vacation a, a little bit, a little bit. Yeah. Uh, let's see what's been going on in the last couple of weeks. Oh, really? Uh, sad news. This was out of the blue. Uh, yeah. Treat Williams passed away. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Oh, that I was kind of hoping I saw that news story and everything was coming out, and I was like, man, I hope this is actually a mistake and everyone's like wrong about this. <laughs> Um, but he he was killed in a motorcycle accident. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah, I think he was uh, seventy one, which is way the hell too young. Yeah, and I mean we loved him in the Phantom. He is a large re- part of the reason that I enjoy the Phantom as much as I do. And honestly, any film that I catch that has Treat Williams in it, yeah, that's why I'm going to have fun watching that film. I thought he was brilliant. He's one of those guys that can chew up the scenery, but in a good way. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like, like it's appropriate when he's doing it. 
So, I mean, that's what he did all over the place in The Phantom. That's what made him fun in that. Yeah. And, of course, I mean, he was in Titanic. He he was – I didn't even know about a lot of the stuff that he did. When he was a real young man, he started in hair. Um, okay. He was doing some television work and everything. And I just I, – I'm just – kind of gutted that you know oh so we're not gonna see more treat williams <laughs> come on we gotta lift the show up <laughs> yeah let's lift the show up a little bit let's look a little forward i started thinking i realized that we were coming up very close to summer we're actually recording on the first day of summer oh yes yes we are um which means the fall would be right around the corner so i've already started thinking about fall and october and halloween and all of that and I thought this year I wanted to try to do something a little different. Mm -hmm. So I started reaching out to some of the local haunted houses in my area. Okay. And seeing if they would be willing to uh, do some interview and some on-site, uh, kind of on-site reporting and such and about their haunts and about the haunted house industry and all that good stuff. And I reached out to a bunch of them and I actually got a, a bite back from, from one, one of them. And so far, it sounds like they're really keen on this idea. And I uh, started talking with one of the organizers, and I'm, I'm waiting for an email come August where I'm going to be invited out to one of their uh, actor training camps. Oh, very cool. Yes. And uh, they're going to, so I'll get a chance to kind of see how they go with that and talk with, with them and uh, you know, take a tour of the haunt and kind of, I want to I wanna get like sort of that inside look of what goes on in making a haunted house sort of thing no that's and, and cool. talk about the uh, the industry and how they had to kind of sort of fight their way through the last three years you know sure. with the pandemic and everything yeah it should be a lot of fun and i realized to do this the way i want and to do it right i was gonna need like a camera person mm -hmm. <laughs> and so i kind of threw it out there on facebook and uh our old friend and former co-host steve actually piped up oh nice that he might be interested in it and helping out so i'm i'm hope I'm hoping he will. So he, it's, it's, I've said it. It's, it's in the podcast. It has to happen now. Well, and not to do a little planning in front of uh, everyone, but if we can figure out how to pair uh, something like that with also the uh, Cincinnati Comic Expo, perhaps we can do at least one of them together. Yeah, no, absolutely. We'll see what happens. I mean, the expo is in September, so that's usually, um, you see, yeah, the haunted houses haven't quite kicked off by then, though. Depends. Yeah, some some yay, some nay. But we'll have to see what can be done. But uh, that could be fun. Yep, uh, we will see what happens. Um, it should be fun. If, if, if it comes together, I'm hoping it's something that I can put together and uh, make some use of the YouTube channel that I have for the, uh, for the show. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, the YouTube channel is pretty much filled with a lot of... Uh, older interviews and um our episodes i've been posting to youtube just with static image and a little waveform <laughs> but it's actually been kicking off it actually kicked off and actually uh created a little bit more of a uh, an attraction than i than i thought it would we certainly don't have like you know crazy numbers but we've got over 300 subscribers to the channel nice which uh surprised me that we've that i was able to get that many that soon with just throwing up our episodes and they get not a lot of hits but a few extra hits so that's really cool so it'd be nice to just do something and have something actually like kind of cool <laughs> on the channel yes, versus no. just uh just the episodes and welcome subscribers <laughs> yeah absolutely and yeah if you guys are listening if anyone's listening on the youtube channel thank you very much and i will hope hopefully have some uh, some more stuff up there i'm thinking the next time i record a uh, a 5 minute review i'm going to try to do it on video as well get that um, shot yeah exactly and and give that a whirl um i've i recorded a ton of them like in advance so i'm just kind of working my way through which i realized after posting uh, one of them that just aired like a week or a week two weeks ago um I talk about a recent, or I just mentioned the date that it's going to be available. I'm like, mm, that was last year. <laughs> Maybe we need to figure out how to do uh, the occasional video podcast version of the show. Yeah, well, we could follow um, Rich and Jeff over at the Classic Horrors Club podcast. They do a, a video companion podcast as well, and 
could we could take a you know a feather out of their uh, cap or their uh, what was it an arrow out of their quiver there and try, <laughs> and uh, try to do something they do. It is mostly I think just kind of talking head, but they do you know throw in the, the the trailers and some images and things like that as they discuss things. It's just it's another big chunk of uh, actual editing that it would uh, entail that, that, that has that kept is, me from doing it. That is next level editing, yes. <laughs> yes. It's not anything I haven't done before. It's just that takes a little extra time. It does. I was browsing through Amazon Prime and saw that they had a, cop, a version of Carnival of Souls from 1962 on there, which is a favorite film of mine. I, I love Carnival of Souls. I've got the uh, like Criterion Blu-ray and and everything. But what attracted me to the one on Amazon, it was actually, it was one that was colorized. Oh yeah. So I thought, well, that's I, morbid curiosity drew me to go ahead and try to check it out. Yeah, I don't know what anyone was thinking, putting color to that film. <laughs> the black and white plays such an important role. I feel in the, in that film that the colorized, it doesn't ruin the film, but I think it does kind of soften a little bit of its edginess. Yeah, no, I mean, if it was made a certain way, leave it be. I mean, 62, it could have been shot in color. It was probably shot in black and white due to expense. Sure. You know, it, was, it was budgetary. I, I, I get it. Would the filmmaker have filmed in color if he had the opportunity? Don't know. You know, we have no idea. But, yeah, no, the film works so much better in black and white. I... Yeah, something like that. Just uh, don't don't colorize it. Well, yeah, and you can remaster without messing with the color, which is what I have on the Blu-ray. The Blu-ray looks incredible, uh, and it definitely doesn't need to be colorized in order to do so. Right. Still a brilliant film. If anyone hasn't watched Carnival of Souls, go and check that out. That's a it's a good one. The only way I've seen that is through a Rift Tracks episode. <laughs> Really? Yes. Oh, you need you you should you should give that a shot on Rift. I I really enjoy that. Okay. I'll have to check that out. Even if you have to watch the color as one, it's on Prime. <laughs> I don't know if they have the black I don't know if they have the black and white with the original on there or not. Actually I think uh Rift Tracks even uh did it to the colorized one. Ah, okay. Oh, this film I gotta tell you about. Yeah. I have a coworker who is a big drive-in aficionado. That's his weekends. Almost every weekend through the summer, he goes to the to a drive-in. Yeah. And he so he's seen lots of different drive-ins. He likes to go to all the special shows and stuff that they do. He'll go see him when they're running all the first run stuff and everything too, but he'll go to the the specials. He brought me a list of like some films that are coming up in the fall that some of these drive-ins are doing for their for Halloween or for the fall season and some really great classic horrors and monster films and things like that. And I I started talking that um I had to go ahead and break down and purchase the uh upcoming Blu-ray for Robot Monster. One of my favorite bad movies. Yeah. And so this thing came out. I was a little uh, hesitant because of the price of the thing, but I was like, I can't not get it because I'm afraid it'll be really limited, and then I'll never be able to touch it for this little <laughs> for this amount again. Yeah. Um, and so we were talking about bad movies that we we've, we've seen that we love and everything. He brought up a film called Rat Fink a Boo Boo. <laughs> okay. <laughs> From 1966. Yeah. I think I'm familiar with Rat Fink, if it's what I think I'm thinking of. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's Fink with P.F. Oh, that is not what I'm thinking of. All right. And apparently what happened with this film is the, uh, the director, Ray Dennis Steckler, he was trying to make a legit, like, gritty crime drama. And about halfway through, he just felt like it wasn't coming together. Yeah. But he'd already shot, like, reels of film. He didn't want to waste. And so in the almost exactly the middle of this film, this thing just leaps off the rails and becomes sort of like a, um, a send-up of the 60s Batman series. Oh, yeah? Yeah, the first 30 minutes, it's 
a tense kind of crime drama. There's this gang and terrorizing women and everything. Some of the scenes are almost a little uncomfortable. I mean, it's like, wow. And then I, I almost can't, I don't want to talk too much about the film, even though the craziness is sort of given away in any poster that you look up on this thing. Yeah. But it's just insane. And I, it blew me away. I thought it was hilarious, but um, definitely not a film for everybody. But <laughs> it is available on Tubi. You can go watch this thing for free. It is absolutely worth the price. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm gonna have to uh, take a gander at that one. You, you, and your friends get together and watch uh, some crappy movies we once do. a week. I recommend rat fink a boo boo rat fink a boo boo okay yep i absolutely recommend it we'll have to put that on the radar <laughs> please do it is just so freaking insane yeah it's rat fink with a, a ph pf 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 yes okay but yeah that's uh that's that's been me the last couple weeks have you been up to anything besides having a birthday? Uh, well, that did eat up quite a bit. Um, uh, the one thing we didn't talk pre-show, uh, I did. I have been to some of the more recent films, like uh, Spider-Man Across the uh, Spider-Verse. Oh, nice. And, and The Flash. Oh, okay. Uh just a little, uh, I'm not going to spoil anything, but just know, listeners, if you haven't seen Spider-Man or across uh, the Spider-Verse yet, uh, go in, and it's probably already been told to you by others at this stage, go in knowing that it ends on a cliffhanger and it is a to-be-continued. I did not know that. I got told that by a friend at work uh, before taking my son to go see it. Um, so we knew going in that that was going to be the case, which was good to know in advance because we went on its opening weekend. Mm -hmm. um, and there were people that did not know this. So at the end of the movie, while we, we know what's that this is happening... When it cuts to the, the credits and all that, the rest of the audience just loses their shit. Oh, I bet. <laughs> just like, no! <laughs> just, that's hilarious. People are yelling in the theater. They are mad because they're like, you you can't know! You're <laughs> not right there. Um, so, uh, totally worth a watch. Lots of fun. Definitely can't wait to see how they end it, but... It is a little unsatisfying All right. <laughs> in the uh, whole that, and then very good, and then the Flash. Find something else to watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I will watch the Flash, but I will wait till that shows up on uh, on Max or something. Yeah, I, I, I with with Michael Keaton in it, um, and, and he he was great. Kind of liked what they did with the character. Was happy to see him. Happy to also see that it wasn't just like a, a tease, like it was he's gonna show up for like five ten minutes and that was gonna be it. No, the, his Batman plays a significant role in the film, so cool. That part was cool, but the, it doesn't it doesn't override the version of the Flash that they have perpetuated. Uh, Ezra Miller already not a big fan uh, of him in general, but. Uh, uh, you can't even nail him for all this. They're the ones that write the Flash to be kind of whiny, kind of mm -hmm. unsure of himself. I'm like he's completely antithetical to what the Flash has been written all of these decades to be. <laughs> yeah, uh, the Flash to me has always been pretty much just uh, very sure of himself, and yeah, he's quick to go half cocked. Yeah, and, he's yeah. confident. He's cocky. He's funny he's charming um he knows all of that about himself which adds to the confidence and the cockiness and that's part of the charm that, that's that's why you like the flash is he 
He's full of himself, but he knows he's full of himself, and because you know that, he's he's just funny. Um, and having this guy that's completely unsure of himself, uh, um, is hating on the rest of his life all the time, it's just, like, okay, we already have a Batman. I don't need another one that happens to run fast. <laughs> so, right. So, um... So, yeah, it was a little disappointing uh, all the way around. They did have, I I will never give it away. There is, um, because this is a, this is the big screen essential version of the Flashpoint um, story from the Flash. Um, They did have a little fun at everybody's expense uh, with, what they ended on. And I'm just going to put it out there. You already started with Ben Affleck as Batman at the beginning. We know we get Michael Keaton. There's another. Okay. <laughs> and I'll leave it at that. So. All right. Fair enough. Um, so that was. Yeah. As soon as it comes to HBO um, or Bax, whatever you want, they want to call right. it. Um, then I'll, I'll watch it, but I am definitely not going to like spend any additional money in order to see it no and i don't recommend that you do i'm glad i got it at discount so right <laughs> so that was all good uh the only other thing that uh, uh as we were discussing prior to the show and i did actually look up to see what the thing was called uh there was a documentary series uh not that long ago came out in 21 and uh, ran over to 22. It was an actual TV series. I did not know that, and I didn't know where it ran. Um, but it was called The Center Seat, 55 Years of Star Trek. Oh, okay. I have heard that title before. Right. Uh, so th- this is a very interesting series where they go over um, the various um, incarnations of Star Trek and... It's not about the content as it is about all the behind the scenes stuff. And as we were discussing, going through it, it was fascinating to hear a lot of it, but it's also a little off putting to hear how much angst and non Star Trek y kind of stuff happened in the making of the Star Treks. Uh, uh, there, there, just lots of misogyny and sexism, a little bit of racism and, and, and mm. such, and like it all ran runs antithetical to the the actual purpose of Star Trek. So it, it did kind of. While I'm always going to enjoy it, it just did take a little notch, a little wind out of the sails. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you just don't want to know how the sausage is made. It, 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 uh, really uh, really don't in some cases so <laughs> i i mean it was fun where where there was triumph um and there was a lot of that uh they of course cover um whoopi goldberg's involvement in, in perpetuating next generation um and, and all that that meant they went over a lot of the the firsts but i mean there was an episode, and I don't even know if you know this, there was one of the writers for Next Gen wrote an episode that introduced um, a homosexual couple that was supposed to be on the ship. Wasn't even really gonna, wasn't gonna dive into it. It was just gonna introduce a character. Somebody was gonna ask a very um, benign question like, oh, hey, how long have uh, you guys been together? How's your husband? Right. Yeah, 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 stuff like that. And because that was in there and... And if I remember that correctly, uh, it's not even so much that the that Paramount shot it down as Gene shot it down. Yeah. Um, and that's <laughs> kind of not what you want to hear about the guy that made, <laughs> made that invented this thing and, and, and has become so beloved to all. So definitely worth a watch. And it's particularly fun uh, to watch Gates McFadden go over her, the her own drama over her character during the next generation years, but nice. I'll have to check it out then. Definitely worth a watch. Uh, particularly, f- it gets a little sadder the further you get into the Star Trek lore because, a- as much as they were on a high with Next Gen, and then they wanted to. Of course, it all's money driven. I mean, Paramount doesn't make this to just 
um, spread the word of about what humanity could become someday, they really want the dollars that we all pay for to go watch it. So, yes. <laughs> um, so let's be real about that. So uh, the reason things like DS9 and Voyager came to be is because of greed. Um, <laughs> and as a result, um, things that maybe should have been paid attention to to either make them better or make the experience better for those that were participating didn't necessarily happen so watch it enjoy it but understand it's a little darker than maybe you might want to hear yeah some of it doesn't entirely surprise me um about Gene Roddenberry I I spoke to his son Rod Roddenberry uh, years ago Mm -hmm. he when he was producing the uh his little documentary called I think it was the Trek Nation okay yeah, yeah, I think it was Trek Nation. And one of the things that he was wanted to do in that in that documentary was kind of show the world that yeah, my dad did a lot of great things, but my dad was human. Right, yeah. It it was a little odd. I mean, there's a lot of people that were a little torn on what he was trying to do. It was almost like that he was there was people who thought he was trying to knock his dad off the pedestal <laughs> kind of thing. Uh and and I think he was just kind of saying if you want to put him up there, just know <laughs> some things about him. No, in which case, I think I could get on board with what he does. I, I, I'm not a big fan of putting anyone on a pedestal because no one is ever as good as you um, envision them to be, dramatize them to be. I'm trying to come up with the correct word that I want to encompass because... Yeah, you take a good... I mean, we've all just gone through a big hunk of that in the past several years. If you take a deep, hard look at anybody's past, they ain't perfect. And to immortalize them and to raise them to a level beyond a human person um, really kind of undercuts maybe what they accomplished because even mm-hmm. flawed, they got this stuff done. Um, I think that works. was kind of a little bit of his point in Trek nation was the idea that, you know, you, you have to know his, his failings to understand why some of the stuff you see in Trek is so important. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I, and, and let's be real. Uh, I mean, as we just covered, Networks and production companies don't do this stuff out of the kindness of their hearts. Uh, so for Gene Roddenberry, who is being a, is a creator, for him to not have an edge about him in some fashion would mean his stuff would never see the light of day. So right. to pardon the term, but if you're not a dick a little bit... <laughs> <laughs> gonna get it done <laughs> right because if you if you're the nice the nice guy doesn't win so in the, and in Hollywood the nice guy really doesn't win <laughs> so you gotta come at it and you gotta make people think what I'm gonna do is gonna make you bajillions of dollars and I'm gonna make it all good and you have to give me all the control otherwise it won't work and that's how you get it done. And sometimes you got to screw people over to do that. And it's not great. <laughs> right. So it's that it's that whole thing. Uh, careful what you wish you were when it comes to your heroes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's, and it, what was it? Uh, sometimes it's best not to meet your heroes or learn too much about them. Right. Like Washington had slaves. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> no one that you think is amazing did it all the right way. All right, well, I think that will probably do it for the first half of the show here. We should probably take a break. Yep. Uh, We'll listen to a promo for another podcast. And then when we get back, we are going to go and take a look at 2008's The Spirit. (laughs) 
Chef Sandwich. You might not know me, barely anyone does, except my mother and her cocker spaniel, Alan. But I have listened to every single movie podcast that has ever been made. I don't get out much, and sometimes I have to make toilet in a bottle. What did he just say, Marjorie? However, having completed this exhaustive research, it is my assertion that the After Movie Diner podcast, with its heady mix of comedy, movie banter, fandom, passion, beards, music, and voluminous thighs, is in fact the greatest movie podcast available anywhere, even Holland. Find the After Movie Diner podcast on Blog Talk Radio, iTunes, Stitcher, and AfterMovieDiner.com. Now, where's that bottle? What are you? What are you? That's what the woman asked me. Am I some sort of ghost? I still move. I still breathe. I'm still alive. The bad guys are winning. Right now, we got our hands full. You're a mess. Three bullets. Straight through me. Last night, you were 20 minutes from the morgue, and now look at you. You have to do something about the spirit. Our profits are down 20%. The spirit thinks he can't stay hurt. I'm getting El Spirito dead while I still can. Something's going down here. Could be big. Octopus big. I'm the octopus. I got eight of everything. You're not making this easy. Brought in a specialist. Someone to seal the deal. She got a thing for the bling. Sam Seraph. So you want me to be a girl? There probably isn't a law in the books that you wouldn't break. Do I look like a good girl? Somebody get me a tie, and it sure as hell better be red. We are locked and loaded. Is every damn woman in this damn hellhole out of her damn mind? No, sir. We're just equipped. I'm gonna kill you all kinds of dead. I'm on my way. Now, The Spirit was written and directed by Frank Miller and stars Gabriel Macht, Ava Mendez, Sarah Paulson, Dan uh, Loria, Scarlett Johansson, and Samuel L. Jackson. The film was based on a newspaper comic strip created by Will Eisner. Uh, Will Eisner was an American cartoonist and writer. He was one of the earliest cartoonists to work in the American comic book industry. And his series, The Spirit, whose original run was from 1940 to 1952, was often noted for its experiments in content and form. The movie tells the story of a former cop who was killed in the line of duty, but is mysteriously resurrected and turned superhero to defend Central City from his arch nemesis, the Octopus. The Octopus is searching for a crate containing the blood of Heracles in order to complete a serum which would allow him to become immortal. Meanwhile, an old flame turned femme fatale, Sans Serif, is leaving dead bodies in her wake as she seeks a crate containing the Argonaut's golden fleece. Each has what the other wants, and the two will do anything to get them. The spirit is caught in the middle, and he must save the world from Octopus while trying to save Sand from herself. Now, as early as the 1970s, uh, someone tried to get a film version of this main, uh, made. William Friedkin attained the, the rights to the spirit and contacted Will Eisner to write a script for him. Eisner declined, but recommended Harlan Ellison who wrote a script for a two-hour live-action film. Freakin and Ellison afterward reportedly had an unrelated argument, and the project was abandoned. In the 1980s, Brad Bird, Jerry Rees, and producer Gary Kurtz attempted to get an animated adaptation off the ground. Even though the studio liked the screenplay, they thought the film would be unmarketable, and this version was scrapped. 
In the early 1990s, producer Michael Uslan, who was the executive producer of all the Batman films since 1989, and executive producers Benjamin uh, Melnicker and Stephen Mayer obtained the rights for a live-action film, but again, nothing materialized. In 2004, financier Odd Lot Entertainment acquired the rights, and they began a collaboration with Uslan, Melnicker, and Mayer, and uh, working at Bat Film Productions to adapt the story. Eisner, who was protective of the rights of his creation, said that he believed in the producers to faithfully adapt the spirit. Comic book writer Jeff Loeb was initially hired to adapt the spirit, uh, but he eventually left the project. And then in 2005, Uslan approached Frank Miller at Will Eisner's memorial service in New York. Uh, This was several weeks after Miller's Sin City had been released in theaters. Miller initially hesitated, but ultimately agreed, making this his first solo project as writer and director. The film apparently had about a $60 million budget. It got all of uh, a little less than $20 million domestically and couldn't break $40 million worldwide. Wow. <laughs> little rough. Uh, wow. <laughs> but... Maybe not entirely surprising. Not after you watch it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had to go look and do a little research and everything. Apparently the original strip was often cited a little bit on the camp. Yeah. Uh, which I was a little surprised when I saw this when with Frank Miller's name detached you were really thinking, I mean, this is Frank Miller. This is dark and gritty Batman Frank Miller. This yeah. is the guy that brought the serious Batman back, yeah, back he, to the he, comics. His, his stories from the 90s are considered legendary. Right. And so when you sit down to Frank Miller's The Spirit and you get something that is, frankly, camp, mm-hmm. What the hell has happened? <laughs> Where did this come from? There are camp elements. Um, and interestingly enough, those are the parts where it, it it's almost endearing. Almost. Like, uh, there was one uh, scene, and I don't even remember what was happening. I just remember catching uh, Gabriel's face uh, as the spirit like somebody yanked him in or, or something and all of a sudden he went all huge wide-eyed and it looked like something out of a cartoon and I'm like well how does that fit in what's going on cuz yeah you you mentioned camp but this thing tries hard to be dark and gritty and 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 in some places completely inappropriate and really offensive. (laughs) Uh, And I don't know if that's what he was really going for or not, but it just was. So, yeah, when you get the camp elements, they're like, this does not fit with what you're trying to do. Yeah, it's very strange because it does... If you watch this with the sound off most of it anyway, yeah. you think you're watching a dark and gritty noir drama. Right. Until the spirit loses his pants while hanging off a gargoyle. Right. <laughs> you're, or, what's going on? Or, or, or as the the villain tries to pe- beat the man to death with a toilet. Right. Because toilets are always funny. Right. <laughs> with, with, which was the last time it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah no uh and i you can't talk about this movie without talking about the style choice um yeah granted frank miller was involved uh in both um sin city and uh and 300 because he was part he wrote those um mm-hmm. uh and i believe he co-directed or something he now ne- this is his first solo direction job, but I yeah, believe I think he, he co-directed Sin City. Yeah, if and, I'm not yeah, and he didn't. And three hundred, he didn't have. He he was an advisor because he was the writer, but uh, he wasn't. He wasn't in the director's seat in any way. Um, and for this to steal so much imagery from those two films 
when that was really kind of not what that comic was like to uh, i mean it was more of a dick tracy feel than a that than this kind of feel so uh, the style choice could have worked if it was a much better film possibly yeah you kind of would want to see this yeah a little bit like the dick tracy where there's yeah. it's just the very um basic color schemes yeah um, lots of primary colors very pop yeah. uh, very poppy um i mean yeah some of the, your classic images of spirit of the spirit is uh him in his blue suit and if you mm-hmm. had made a blue suit that really really popped like electric blue uh, on the screen and then had the red tie waving in in the breeze that would have been more in line with uh, the original than this was yeah I, I think that's the problem that this film one of the problems this film has is that it really can't decide on which it looks like one thing but it's written like another and it's yeah, the two just don't gel. They don't. And then, I mean, the storytelling in this is like your synopsis makes that sound like the movie should make complete sense. Um, <laughs> and, and your synopsis is not in any way wrong. That is what happens in the film. But honestly, you can lose yourself in the way that this thing is edited and, and, and put together that. You're like, oh wait, that's what that's what we're talking about. Because some of the scenes just go in in a direction like there is like death is a character in this in this film. Why? Because they're they're essentially undead. I get that part. So it's supposed to be about the flirting with uh, the great unknown. But how does having any of that involved while you're trying to basically tell a story of gaining ultimate power through these old Greek um, mythical objects <laughs> that doesn't they, they don't jive <laughs> I was digging around doing some research for this and since you talked about like his his suit being different than in, in the comics mm-hmm. uh, it kind of paraphrased from the website tvtropes.org The comic book The Spirit is about a man with no powers who's a celibate hero that gets nervous around women and wears an ugly off-the-rack blue and white suit. This film is about a revived dead guy with a healing factor who is in a stylish, tailored, black-on-black suit and chases every skirt in the city. Oh, not just chases. Um, He has... That's a power unto itself. He can talk to any woman in this film and they melt like butter oh, including death including death yes <laughs> so uh, which is again why the death thing kind of weirds me out like you're almost supposed to assume maybe he came back not because he was shot up with the octopus's little serum uh but maybe it's because he can just talk her out of it <laughs> <laughs> That would have actually been a better angle. Wouldn't it? (laughs) In the comics, his enemy, the octopus, is an intimidating and powerful gangster obsessed with not letting anyone see his face. In the film, he's a lower-tier scientist with ambitions of godhood who is incredibly vain and show-offy about his good looks. (laughs) And It's Samuel L. Jackson. You can't not have him on the screen, and he is very flamboyant, and he is... On the screen. He is there. Well, yeah, we just got done talking about Treat Williams at the beginning and how he could choose scenery uh, in the best of ways. So does Samuel L. Jackson. And honestly, he's probably one of the more entertaining elements of this film. If he isn't chewing the scenery up, then you're just waiting for him to come back on the screen to do more of it. Mm -hmm. His fight scene at the beginning... Uh, granted, toilet included, but his fervor in just wanting to enjoy beating the living daylights out of the spirit, that was fun. That, that was a fun scene. <laughs> I, I do like the fact that they both know that they can't really hurt the other. Right, they're not going to die. They, well, they can hurt, but they, right. uh, they're coming back. <laughs> yeah, they can't kill the other. Right. So, yeah, Octopus just takes joy out of 
whooping up on spirit. And then he gets, oh, okay, okay, I'm kind of tired. That's enough for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll see you around. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that whole sequence, uh, you could have just had a movie of just that. <laughs> I'd have been okay. It, it made me think of the old, uh, uh, Looney Tunes with the um, the sheepdog and 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 the wolf <coughs> that clock in and out, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> morning, Ralph. Morning, Sam. Yeah. <laughs> no, that that's a that's yeah that that is a very eloquent um, metaphor for this. That's exactly what their relationship was like. The spirit wasn't incredibly clear on why he was so hard up to actually end. The octopus. I mean, yeah, he he's the bad guy. I get that, but they're, given that they have this angsty kind of quality about them, I, I wasn't. It's unclear what's really driving him here. Yeah, you didn't really get to see, you know, what did the octopus do to kind of how bad was he? You know, were told he's bad, right? And he tells us that he's bad. Yeah. But so far, the only crime we've seen him is trying to obtain some stolen goods. Well, and plus we could get into the whole Nazi drama thing that they did. (laughs) That I don't know where the hell that came from. (laughs) It came from the same place as the samurai outfit and the the, the, the pimp coat and the, yeah. Just, just because, because that day the octopus woke up and decided, I want to dress like a Nazi. Right, and, and the whole parade around it. Yeah, no, and that's the you. You do make a good point. He does kind of make uh, like I'm even watching a little trailer running while while we're going through here, and I didn't actually put that all together. Uh, the Samuel L. Jackson character, all of the costuming, all revolves around like. Baddy nationalities. Uh, so yes, you get the the German Nazis. You get kind of a, a Japanese warrior feel uh, during one sequence. Uh, one of the things I just saw, he's in more of a Russian uh, um, fur coat. Yeah, he's got the fur coat and the hat, and he, 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 he's a Bolshevik kind of feel to him, and like. I didn't even put that together as I was watching that the first time. I'm like, oh, he he literally trying to look like what someone perceives as a bad guy every right. single time. The the last thing that the TV tropes uh, said about the film, he says, the original comic was by Will Eisner and was quite colorful and upbeat. This movie is essentially a PG-13 Sin, Sin City. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kind of goes right back to what you were saying about the, the, the look. And the look is very much, it is the stylized, kind of rotoscoped everything that, 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 that Sin City was so unique that even though Frank Miller's involved in this film, mm-hmm. it feels like someone's copycatting Sin City. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. And, and not in as successful a way. Like, you took the spirit out of the title uh, and just say this was a sequel to Sin City? I wouldn't have been able to tell you. You were wrong. <laughs> yeah, it could have existed in the same universe with the same, with the style and everything. It was just, uh, you know, like like you said, like like like, like they said, it's a, just a PG-13 sort of, uh, it's it's the more suburb uh, Sin City. Now, now, again, and this is where my lack of knowledge of the spirit and its characters comes into play, and we'll have another little offshoot to discuss later that I'm even looking at some of the IMDb for, and I don't see um, where the character names parallel, but the character names seem like something more right out of Dick Tracy than they do the spirit. Yeah, like the octopus might have been the octopus. The spirit is right. the spirit, but like was San Serif really the name of a character? Uh, or how about uh, um, Samuel L. Jackson's uh, henchmen that were named after uh, the states of ego? <laughs> 
I have no idea. I wish I knew more about the the uh, the comic itself. Kind of, yeah. If anything, um, I almost want to dip into some of the stories of the comics to um, liberate the spirit from this movie. <laughs> okay, here we go. I just found uh, these character names are from the uh, from the comic. Okay. Um, there is some changes and, and stuff. Uh, although the octopus is in the comic, it's actually Dr. Cobra is a mad scientist that uh, uh, inadvertently helps Danny Colt become the spirit, brings him back from the dead or something. Okay. Uh, he still does not have a healing power or anything like that, as far as I can tell in the comics. Yeah. Lorelei Rocks is a, a, a siren who is uh, death. Right. But there is Sans Serif, a childhood friend of uh, Denny Colt. Okay. And uh, Silken Floss is an accomplice to the octopus. So those characters are all straight from the books. Okay, well, uh, uh, I'll return at least a little credit back to them. Yep. In, in, in which case, it's just a matter of who stole from who first. Uh, Dick Tracy or the spirit? <laughs> yeah, whoever. Whichever came first. Yep, exactly. First saw this movie years ago. I... I think it must have popped up on Prime or something like that. Yeah. And this was ages and ages ago. And I'm like, oh, I never heard of this. And I, 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 I know I watched it, and I'm pretty sure I thought it was weird. I didn't understand. I didn't get, you know, I thought this was going to be the, the a gritty drama or something like, um, well, I thought it was going to be along the lines of, like, maybe not gritty, but I thought it was going to be something along the lines of The Shadow. Right or 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 the Phantom. Right, and it's not no. Even though some might say it is, I mean, depending on wh- where you sit on the Shadow or the Phantom movies. <laughs> well, again, um, yeah, and w- one can discuss uh, the validity of bringing uh, characters from the 1940s that didn't per- re- perpetuate themselves. Obviously, Superman, Batman, they all lived. On because they continued forever. But these are characters that kind of died back in their day. I mean, um, well, yeah, no, actually, I think most of them have been consistently published, but not in the same way that Batman or Superman. Right? Was. Yeah, uh, but they haven't. You have to be a, a, a fan of it to to really know about it. Yeah, um, they've never been a DC or Marvel property. They've always if if they've been in any comic book uh, company or whatever, they're if you're lucky, Image or you know Moonlight, or, you know they're going to be something some very small uh, property, not not the big guys, right? And well, and then by then they'll have been twisted a, a bit too. And but that's what I'm saying is they're not um, they're not in the public eye as much as some others, so. To keep trying to bring these back and then put them in the forefront without a whole lot of backstory. And that that's kind of what this struggle, despite the fact that this thing is narrated, we are kind of given the entirety of the origin of the spirit. It's I still don't feel like I get where he's coming from, despite all of this stuff that they told us <laughs> like i don't know what his motivation is and, and and his rather peculiar lust for his city <laughs> did you get it's did you just, get vibes of the tick a little bit yeah <laughs> but not in a good way the, i mean the tick was nuts <laughs> but well, I don't know. The, the Denny Colt here as the spirit, he he did die and was resurrected. That, that might do things to the old brain. I, I, I suppose, but then, uh, like, the original store version that you're talking of, where uh, the spirit was a little unsure of himself with women, and this, this spirit is fully in love with the city, and yet he can make time with literally anyone mm-hmm. <laughs> and you're like I, I'm, I'm failing to see how the kid that we saw that was trying to um, make a real relationship out, out of the bad girl 
in his neighborhood, uh, gets his heart broken, still goes off to be a cop. We don't get a whole lot of character development after the breakup. So all we're b- busy told is that he does become a cop and then he gets killed. Yeah. Um, we have no no other motivation there. And then, of course, then we get the octopus and he resurrects him and all that stuff. Um, but, I mean, yeah, I, how did he – how did the city become his lady? <laughs> right. I don't get that at all. <laughs> yeah, you could have used a little – a little story as to why he uh, felt so dedicated to the to the place, or especially with something as generically named as Central City, <laughs> right? I think in the uh, I read in the comic he originally started in New York City, yeah, but then Eisner decided to to move him someplace generic, so they could tell you know pretty much any tale without any and draw, I suppose, without having to do anything in particular right you don't have to call out uh specific things and then you don't have to have your audience go well that's not where that was or yeah how the hell did he get all the way across town in that short of time right, right? Yeah, exactly <laughs> especially when he's just guy on foot he didn't even have a cool car nope nope he just ran he just parkoured <laughs> from one building top to another what what which was impressive yes and, and admittedly any opportunity they did got to get gabriel out of his shirt uh was was one that they took um, that was actually from the books too uh, actually the uh, eisner was <laughs> he drew him with uh having his shirt ripped off and and shirtless and whatever quite a lot so apparently that was uh that was keeping into in the spirit of the spirit. Okay, well the, then the, that's fine. But of course, Gabriel had himself a very uh, kudos to him and his trainer. So, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. no, he definitely there was definitely some good uh, some beefcake as well as cheesecake in this film. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. No. He, he gave he gave as good as the women had to give. Uh, <laughs> but to which we should get into a little bit of that. <laughs> I mean, literally, our bad guy takes a photocopy of her own ass. <laughs> <laughs> and then he uses that to, to track her down. Yeah, no. Oh, there's a perfect butt. I know whose that is. <laughs> Solid detective work there, spirit. Yeah, let's talk about the rest of the cast. So Gabriel uh, Macht, M-A-C-H-T, Macht? Macht, Macht. I'm not familiar with him at all. I, I don't know if I've seen him in anything else. I, actually, and he uh, I looked at him up because uh, he's actually one of those... Uh, I actually do know a good hunk of his material because he starred on a show called Suits. Right, yeah, uh, I saw that. Where he played a character... Bef- <laughs> the name was perfect for just his look, and it kind of goes along. I'm sure he got that role because of even the spirit... Uh, because his name was Harvey Specter, and, oh, nice. and, and he's a he's a kick-ass uh, Harvard-trained lawyer in New York City. So, um, and in that series, he's just super slick and crazy smart, and he's that guy everybody kind of wants to be. Mm, <laughs> um, okay. So, well, then I I I think honestly for. The hero that they were trying to kind of make the spirit in this film, well cast. Yes. No, no, no. Uh, I thought he was great. It's one of those things, though. Um, I mean, he'll be picked on for being in it. And he might even be picked on for his performance. But I, it's I, this is one of those, is it the actor or is it the writing and directing? <laughs> You're right. No, I think he was great with what he had. Right. Or what what he what he was given. Right. Yeah, no, cuz I I felt like he was all in. He was he was trying to be that guy. It's just it, the guy was written so terribly <laughs> that that it, it's hard to know how you're supposed to play it at all times. Sometimes that goofy uh that that more campy feel did come through. But then there were the other times where he's trying to be dark and foreboding and he's a Batman shadow phantom, any of those darker noir style 
Right. Like, I, you could have caught a bit of Dark Man in there, too. <laughs> oh, I hadn't thought of that, yeah. Especially with the uh, the uh, the trench coat flapping constantly and the f- mm-hmm. black fedora. <laughs> oh, yeah. And we already talked a little bit about Samuel L. Jackson. I mean, what can you say? I mean, he is definitely chewing the scenery into this, and he may be the highlight of the film. Right. Yeah, no, he, he's what makes it fully entertaining every time he's on the screen. Um, Scarlett Johansson as Silken Floss, uh, the, the, the octopus's uh, right-hand woman. Mm-hmm. And what I found fascinating with that, I could have almost gone for after she gave her little uh, synopsis of herself and all that, and then especially at the ending, and she's she's going to carry on. I could have gotten into a, what happened to Silken Floss? <laughs> Yeah, she's described here, I was just looking at the wiki, she's only slightly more sane than Octopus. And I, that's a pretty good descriptor. She is definitely a little off her boil. Right. But, but yeah, it, you... I found her to be the more sinister one. Uh, possibly, but she was also, I think, a, um, a little bit of a Harley Quinn. Well, yeah, but it, to that to that effect, meaning she could surpass her um, her partner in, in everything. Like, yeah, no, she in many ways humored him and probably uh, was the brains of the operation, whether he knew it or not, or whether he would. Uh, I was going to say whether he would um, admit recognize it. it or not. Yeah. even. Yeah, you kind of got the impression from what little time he got with her that she was running the show and humoring him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely a character you could have uh, you could have played with more. Yeah, no, she was fascinating. I liked her. Ava Mendez is San Seraph, the childhood childhood sweetheart, grown up to uh, be a master jewel thief and criminal, kind of an anti-hero in this universe. Yeah, someone's got to teach Ava how to read scripts and pick better. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, not well served in this film. No, but I I had flashes of her character from Ghost Rider. Oh, you know, I never got around to that. That's okay. Move along with your life. (laughs) Good, all right. (laughs) It, it it's a fun watch just from the perspective of if you want to know what not to do. <laughs> yeah, I actually found um, the actress that played her younger self more uh, engaging. Yes, quite. Uh, uh, Sachel Gabriel as the young Sans Serif. I, she was actually a lot more engaging than Ava Mendez. And, but they but well cast as far as trying to make me believe that these were the same people just you know, 15, 20 years later. Well, see, that's why uh, I'm picking on Ava in this, this too, because it's funny in the Ghost Rider movie, there's also a younger version of her <laughs> played by an actress that coincidentally looks a great deal like her. Oh, well, um, yeah. So there's like this knack for doing that. of like, read other stuff. <laughs> we had Sarah Paulson as Ellen Dolan. The uh, police commissioner's daughter and uh, the woman who's smitten with the spirit like every other woman. But this one's supposed to be like the, oh, they'll get together someday, girl. Right. Which which this is where it starts getting into the weirder aspects of this. Uh, Yeah. Since this is not the spirit from the comics, um, the fact that he seems to be able to fall for or have every woman fall for him the fact that she hangs on to him it is a little diminishing uh, no absolutely <laughs> despite the fact that she was fantastic as the character uh, Sarah Paulson always has a presence when she's on screen yeah no she did fine but yeah her character was just you felt like this is um is she like damaged or something right. somehow that she is so such such low self-esteem that she'll not go on with her life or find someone that's going to actually treat her right and and not skip out on her with every woman that comes along because she's so smitten with this guy is like that's that's disturbing definitely and i'm going to use that as a little segue because 
I was both enamored with and puzzled by some of the choices. This film is shot in a very noir style, supposed to have kind of a 30s, 40s vibe to it, but yet is firmly taking place in a time where all of the technologies of the 2000s are available. I actually like that about the film. Well, that, that's what I'm struggling with, is I thought it was kind of cool, but a little like I was having a, I was struggling to put my head around it. And I'm like, are we out of time, in time? What time is it? <laughs> like, Yeah, no. No, I, I, but what was endearing about it is that whole, uh, like the Batman, the animated series quality where all of the technologies that were around were available, but they all have a very kind of art deco 30s vibe to them. Right. So this kind of did the same thing, but there were times where maybe some of it seemed out of place uh, where other times, like I totally get it, like him pulling out his phone and... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and it just it looked like a razor. It there was no effort to like make it to stylize it at all. It just looked like a cell phone you could buy at the time. Right, and as we're having this like a Ava's character Sand is walking in with her uh, boy toy of the moment uh, partner at the time, and they walk into the uh, uh, the guy that screwed them over, and they're mm, they're right. confronting him, and this is when she does the photocopier thing with her butt. I'm like, this is out of place with the mood that's going on. <laughs> yeah, isn't it weird? His whole office is all kind of dark, muted colors and everything, and then she sits on a very beige photocopier. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, first off, would that really be in this man's office? Uh, <laughs> You'd think he'd keep that out by by his secretary, but yeah. But I, I but yeah, the the, the whole yeah, it just kind of felt weird that whole moment there, and I, 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 all of that just so she could uh, she make could make the perfect ass crack, and I right. I did add the little pun there on the end at, on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> Dan Loria as uh, the commissioner Dolan. Mm-hmm. Everyone knows him as the dad from The Wonder Years. Right. <laughs> he was... He's great. Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry. That, that's just a... That's good, smart casting is what that is. <laughs> he, pull, he, 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 he pulls off that, that gruff, uh, fatherly figure kind of guy very well. The last two I mentioned, uh, the Stan Akatic is Morgan, Morgan Stern. Weird damn character. Not sure what the hell... <laughs> What's going on with that? The the rookie that yells everything. Uh, yeah, but she's damn cute. <laughs> <laughs> Louis Lombardi, who played all of uh, Octopus's cloned henchmen. Yeah. Phobos, Logos, Pathos, uh, uh, Adios Amigos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We was listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was trying to remember where I saw him from last. The last thing I saw him was the not the most recent reboot of Fantasy Island, but I guess it would have been the early 2000 reboot. Okay. He was uh, more or less the uh, tattoo of that version. Oh, really? With uh, Malcolm McDowell. He was one of the uh, one of the employees, we'll call him, of the of the island. Okay. I actually kind of liked that series. I'm kind of sorry that one didn't take off. I think it could have gone to some fun places. I I had missed that one, so. Yeah, so did a lot of other people. <laughs> it's got Malcolm McDowell as Mr. Rourke. Oh, I did see some of that, but so he was the tattoo character? He was one of them, yeah. Oh, man, I, I clearly have uh, blanked out a lot of that. No, but I did care for uh, Malcolm McDowell in that. Yeah. Yeah, that was good. No, but I, I, he was a, he, he's kind of a fun, uh, definitely in this one, a, a very, you know, comedic goofball character. He's a, he's a guy who could get by playing some serious dark heavies, but I don't think I've ever seen him do that role. H his parts have always been sort of like 
the 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 silly dumb guy. Right, the goofier version of a of a tough. Yeah, guy. I'd actually, I'd actually really would like to. I'm curious if anybody knows if anyone's more familiar with Louis Lombardi's film work, if he's ever done or television work, if he's ever actually done like the dark heavy because i think he could do pull it off and it'd be really neat to see him do that having only seen him as the the silly dumb guy well as one of the few people and you might be as well that haven't seen it he was in the sopranos oh was he yeah he did a nine an episode arc in the uh, sopranos so nice so i assume okay. he did play a dark or <laughs> heavy at some point all right well cool now well, i probably have to go and uh, check out some scenes from that there you go we are identifying some actually fairly fun moments with some pretty heavy hitter cast here so if you can take it apart and just enjoy certain sequences you can have a lot of fun with this film yeah if you try to think of it as a whole uh your brain starts to melt and ooze out of your ear (laughs) It just doesn't come together. There's not... No. It it, it is a giant mess, but with elements that were kind of cool and fun. (laughs) And I do think, and I do do believe, that it fits into our theme, because I actually really love the look of the film. Mm -hmm. No, it is beautiful. Uh, This is a style that... I mean, there's a reason it did well for for Sin City, um, and then doing it in a different way uh, for 300 worked. I think it's funny, though, it is one of the... This style can wear itself out in a hurry. If you think of Sin City and 300 as where it was done successfully, they made sequels to both of those, and those did not do very well. <laughs> because... No, no. At that I never point, got around... I, I never got around to Sin City too. Right, no, I still, to this day, I haven't seen that. But, I mean, which, which I'm dumbfounded by. I loved the first one. I really did. Yeah. <laughs> so I was kind of excited for a second one, and but there was something about it that just said, the first one, that'll do. I mean, I, it's fine on its own. Leave it alone. Um, so I didn't get to it. I've seen the uh, 300, and I saw the sequel to 300, which is really kind of a prequel, I think. Hmm. I had never got around to that one. No, either. it is a sequel. Um, but again, um, I don't know, because it didn't... It tried to use all the same style, but because we had already done that once before, it didn't It didn't have the punch that the first one had. Well, and it, that happens a lot. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's... You go back and you think about something like Jurassic Park. Right. Jurassic Park, the film... It's an okay movie. Right. What makes it stand apart from so many other films, and certainly for many of the sequels, was that it hadn't been done before. Right. You know, those dinosaur effects, the mixture of live, uh, you know, practical and, and, and CG effects, it made something really special. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was, you know, lightning in a bottle. And then the sequels aren't all really any worse than probably that film but it was we've we've seen it well yeah and then when you get into the sequels of the sequels when we switch it over to uh, a lost world uh, yeah, the, yeah world instead of park um you essentially the, the first uh, jurassic world is jurassic park right just with different cast and a little bit bigger yeah <laughs> Yeah, so that, there's something to be said for you have something that worked right. and it's a big hit and everyone loved it. Walk away, you know. You're not going to recapture that magic. I mean, we're gonna. I think we're gonna see it again here real soon, or maybe it already came out. Has Avatar two come out yet? Yep, been and gone. Yeah, see, there you go. Avatar, one of the biggest blockbusters ever. Right. The sequels. Yeah, whatever. To this day, we've, uh, despite we've having full access to it, I haven't watched the sequel of that. No, I, I, I hadn't actually realized it had come out. <laughs> um, that, that's just it, and it's because 
I've been there. I've done that. You know, you did something special. You did something that no one had done before. You're never, ever going to recapture that. No, and, well, a lot of these also fall prey to the fact that because you did have something special the first time, you don't, they, no one's taking any chances to make it new and different in some way. Mm-hmm. You can still use the same style because you set the tone with that. But if you don't tell a dramatically different story, why do I care? <laughs> there is something I want to talk about spirit related, but we should yes. probably stick with this film and, and, and talk about um, uh, listener opinions and the, and the critics first here. Okay. And I didn't get anything from on, on the social medias because, frankly, I don't think many people have seen this film. <laughs> that could be fair. Uh, I got one comment on Facebook. Uh, some says that the cadence to the film made it drag, unfortunately. Pretty film, though. So that's about what... <laughs> that's a great way to sum it up. So shall we dip into uh, the experts? Yeah, I want to hear some of the reviews for this thing. All righty. So starting with the Chicago Tribune, Michael Phillips. Um, <laughs> he sets the tone right away. Uh We have our winning entry in the worst scene in 2008 cinema sweepstakes. It it arrives halfway through the achingly poor screen version of The Spirit, based on the comic book series begun in 1940 by artist and writer Will Eisner. In a Nazi vaudeville interlude, Samuel L. Jackson, dressed like Colonel Clink with a monocle... Shares the screen with Scarlett Johansson, dolled up as if rehearsals for a remake of Ilsa, She-Wolf of the SS, were starting any minute. They gas on about their plans for immortality and Hercules' mystical blood and various failed experiments while their prisoner, the masked supernaturally hardy, crime fighter known as the spirit played by Gabriel Mock sits there muttering how bored he is with their act and how dull (laughs) yet offensive nice trick (laughs) so yeah way to way to come out swinging there uh yeah it just continues on with uh how how this is just it's all it's all flash and no substance. It, you know that scene too when the spirit's tied to the chair. That's the one time in the film that he breaks the fourth wall and talks to the audience, and it's really out of nowhere. Right. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, you you didn't do it before. Why are you doing it now? Yeah, you could have easily done that. He's he'd already done. We we'd had him do some narration. Yes. But narration isn't fourth wall breaking. No, not at all. You could have simply done that in that scene. You could have shot that scene a little differently and just had the voiceover fill in those same thoughts. Sure, that would have made more sense. Then we have from the Oregonian, uh, from Joel Autumn. I assume I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, The spirit is a loony, embarrassing mess that takes the late Will Eisner's classic comics creation and beats it senseless with a giant toilet bowl. Literally at one point. (laughs) So. Yep. Big fan. Uh, And then it goes on to talk more about uh, Frank Miller. Um, And it's not particularly forgiving to Frank Miller because it goes on about his his fantastic runs uh, during the late 80s, early 90s uh, with The Dark Knight Returns and Sin City and 300 and says how amazing those were and that he had no business directing anything. So, so, yeah. Because even uh, the Sin City and, and 300, it was commentary on those were directed by other people. It was his work, but they were directed, which is part of why that went off better. And then, of course, I've all I returned to Roger Ebert, who did actually write this one. So we're we're getting close to him not being around much longer. Uh, one star. Ouch. 
Uh, e even the tagline at the beginning of this is awesome. Spirit sliced into butcher's cuts, mailed too far away zip codes. <laughs> and I think he's referring to the movie more than the scene where that was actually <laughs> stated. Um, he goes on to say, the spirit is mannered to the point of madness. There is not a trace of human emotion in it. To call the characters cardboard is to insult a useful packing material. The <laughs> movie is all style, style without substance, style whirling in senseless void. The film's hero is an ex-cop reincarnated as an immortal enforcer. For all the personality he exhi exhibits, we would welcome Elmer Fudd. <laughs> okay. So... <laughs> So not a fan, apparently. No, no, no. No. So, uh, yeah, it, it's it's pretty unanimous that uh, the, this was apparently a train wreck of a film for most. Yes. Well, when doing some research, I stumbled on the fact that there was a 1987 TV movie, The Spirit, which was uh, set up to be a potential pilot for a television series. Okay. Uh, this is something that you can obtain through uh, Warner Archive. They'll do a burn-on-demand DVD. Oh, wow. Uh, somebody was nice enough to actually upload it to archive.org. And though we do not uh, approve or condone the uh, illegal uh, uploads of, of films, you know, it's there already. So <laughs> You happen to watch it without knowing. I, I yeah I I watched it before I realized what I was watching right. Uh, this is a much better adaptation from what I've read of the comic. This would have been a this is a much better adaptation of the comic. It it's actually quite a lot of fun. Huh. I'm sorry this series didn't happen. I'm I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to watch it ahead of this show because I'm gonna have to go back and and catch that because. The spirit himself sounds like an interesting character, so I'd love to see it done properly. Yeah, this uh, TV movie stars Sam Jones, uh, Flash Gordon himself. Nice. And uh, Nana Visitor, who pre Deep Space Nine. Uh, Sam Jones is brilliant as the spirit. I really enjoyed this. I was amazed how much I enjoyed this. Actually, I mean, it is definitely late eighties, you know, really feels more mid eighties. Um, it's a lower budget than certainly, you know, the 2008 <laughs> uh, sure. spirit. And obviously they like the graveyard is very obviously studio set kind of thing and, and all that, but no, it was actually quite a lot of fun and it's a really good take on the spirit from what I've read from about how the character is in the comics, this is it. It sort of walks a little bit of a line of being like a, um, oh, people have compared it a little bit to like the, uh, the sixties Batman. Okay. But it doesn't go that far into, into the, the campiness. Yeah. So it, it stays in just being, it's not comedic, but it's fun. Cool. Uh, but yeah, I really recommend checking that out versus the 2008. <laughs> I'm sorry we didn't review this instead. <laughs> yes, but then it wouldn't have necessarily fit into the, well, it looked pretty. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. Well, Sam Jones in this and the Nana Visitor both look really pretty. <laughs> sure, but I'm sure that's where it stops. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm afraid so. But they got the suit right and everything in this one. It is the blue suit. He wears his blue gloves. Nice. So, and he's not nigh immortal or anything. He's just a guy. No, that's fair. But uh, I, I, honestly, I'd have been okay with uh, that component in the 2008 version if they had just done better with it. But yeah, I, uh, I guess that's going to do it. It's... I honestly, I went in hoping that I would get a little bit more enjoyment out of this right. film than I remembered. I, I was hoping, okay, I'm going to, I know what it is now. I, I have a better idea. I'll get a little something more out of it. I really don't. I mean, I'm going to forget about most of this film 
within a week. Well, yeah, and the way that the things cut together, um, yeah, you'd be, I, I, I'd be impressed if you can glue it all together in your head at, at five minutes after you've seen it, let alone a week, a month, a year. Um, yeah, no, I could probably tell you a bunch of scenes, but as far as if what order they showed up in in the film, I I probably couldn't. I, honestly, I'm gonna say I, I could watch it again. It's chaotic. It, 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 it's a nightmare to kind of watch, but the individual scenes, I could probably have a little fun as long as I don't care about it. Like, it could be a background thing where all of a sudden I check it out. I'm like, oh, yeah, that, that part was cool. Well, uh, on the schedule is another kind of special effects extravaganza, uh, and it will be a first-time watch for me. On the list is 10,000 B.C., also from 2008. Yeah, actually, that'll be a first-time watch for me as well. So we'll see about that one. It's it definitely, from what I could tell from the trailer, it does look impressive. I'm curious whether there's anything, any any uh, substance uh, under all the style. Okay. Well, then I'm looking forward to us uh, both watching this for the first time. Well, we'll be back in a couple weeks with that. If you've seen 10,000 BC, please drop us a note and follow the link in the show notes to all the social media outlets, and you'd leave a comment there. Or uh, email timeshifter pod timeshifterspodcast at gmail dot com. All right, Tom. I guess that's it. Yes. And we need to go. the The city needs me. <laughs> your lady, your love, the city. We'll talk to everyone in a couple weeks, and I do mean a couple weeks. <laughs> he promises this time. See, see everybody. Bye. See you.